All righty. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for the official first in our series of the Cards Insider Series. We are very excited to have you all here tonight. Uh, we are streaming live via Facebook, um, and we are excited to tell you a little bit more about classroom tips from a faculty favorite. Um, tonight is really all about what it's like to be and how to be successful as a student inside the classroom and faculty expectations for college students um, and maybe how they might differ from what you're used to many of y'all coming from high school. Um, I will introduce myself. My name is Kevin Buckley and I am an admissions counselor here at the University of Louisville. Um, again, we're really excited to have you all here tonight. Um, tonight's presentation will be available after it is over um, via Facebook. So if you ever want to refer back to it or to get some more of those great tips from Dr. Ross um, that you'll hear in just a moment, uh, you definitely can visit our U of L admissions Facebook page, um, the page you're on now, hopefully, um, and refer back to anything that we talk about tonight. Now, we are honored tonight to be joined by Dr. Edna Ross. Dr. Ross works at U of L in the psychological and brain sciences department. Um, she is commonly known as one of the faculty favorites here on campus, and we are honored to have her here tonight, especially because this is usually a presentation that she gives during our live in-person summer orientation. So we are very excited for obvious reasons to be able to offer this online um, for anyone who wants to join, but especially for students who might be might have missed out on the opportunity to get this in because we transitioned over to a virtual orientation. Now, a few things about the ways tonight's are going to work. So um, Dr. Ross will begin with a presentation talk a little bit more about what it's like to be a college student, um, how to be successful inside the classroom, and what faculty expectations you, she might have or others might have for college students and college learners. Um, you all might have questions, and we love those questions. So um, if you have a question, feel free to ask it in the comment section of this video. Um, and after Dr. Ross does the first part of her presentation, we will open it up to a live Q&A um, to answer some of those questions that you all have. Now, many of y'all might have questions about our pivot to fall or our reopening plan, um, and we totally understand that. For tonight, you can go ahead and send those questions to your admissions counselor. You can always find the contact info for your admissions counselor on our U of L website. We also are going to have a pivot to fall um, Facebook Live event similar to this, where we will answer all of your questions on July 8th. And you'll get notifications and emails about that as well. But we really want to keep tonight especially focused on how to be a successful student um, and what faculty expectations are for students once they get to college. So um, I will also note that we do have an ASL interpreter. And so if you do need ASL interpretation, we do have that. Um, and you should see that on your screen tonight. But without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Ross. Thank you again so much for being here with us tonight, Dr. Ross. And you can take it away. Hello, I am very, very excited and happy uh, about this opportunity to share with you faculty expectations and to also welcome you to uh, the U of L campus community. Uh, first thing I want to do is to apologize for the raspiness of my voice. For the first time in my life, long life, I might add, I'm actually taking allergy shots for the allergy symptoms that I've been having, which include includes a raspy voice and sometimes a cough. So it's not COVID, it's allergies. I'm gonna have a t-shirt printed up that says, it's not the plague, it's pollen. So I just wanna apologize if I have to uh, swig some water or do something like that. So from the very beginning, I've been faculty here at the University of Louisville for over three decades. I'm not saying how many years at this point, three decades is a long time. And I've been teaching introductory psychology the entire time, which is arguably the largest course at the University of Louisville. We typically, uh, before the COVID issue, uh, had two sections of introduction to psychology offered every semester with over 300 students in each section. So I basically uh, teach typically in introduction to psychology over 700 students every semester. And that's been for a long time. So you might say I've had a lot of experience in helping students succeed 
I've had a lot of experience in, uh, in uh, observing student behavior and being able to predict which behaviors will uh, result in a successful outcome and which student behaviors will uh, result in a not so successful outcome when we're talking about uh, college uh, performance and college work. Uh, I want to say it's an honor that I have been selected to represent U of L faculty because U of L faculty are amazingly accomplished. Uh, faculty do everything from writing textbooks to creating uh, new devices, let's say in engineering. Uh, faculty have hundreds of patents. Uh, I personally uh, serve on the advisory board for major textbook publishers uh, for psychology. And I've also served as the critical thinking consultant for the educational division of the New York Times. So we all come to you with a wealth of experience, with a wealth of background and knowledge to help you succeed. Now you say, wow, she just said that she has hundreds of students in her class. How could she possibly attend to and help any one student succeed? Well, it's easy because I don't see 300 students at a time. I see one student at a time. Although when you're in a class with 299 of your closest friends, in addition to you, it's going to be up to you more so to let me know what you need. It'll be up to you to make sure you attend to office hours, for example. Uh, I said previously how busy faculty are. We are mandated, for example, we are mandated by the Kentucky General Assembly. U of L is mandated to, to be a research university. So faculty are required to do research which means we're not just sitting around in our offices eating bonbons between classes and hoping someone will drop in and you know so we can share our bonbons with them. So we're very busy. So that means office hours are incredibly important. Office hours are the time we set aside for you, no matter what else I have to do, no matter what else is on my calendar, office hours are your time your time to interact with me and to let me know or any of us know if you're having problems and how you can succeed in the class. So office hours are very, very important. Uh, we're still in the process of devising how we're going to run things fall semester, but office hours will be an important component no matter how we choose to do that. Um, I want to say also that normally I would give you the top three points my faculty colleagues would want you to know about being successful in any of the U of L faculty classrooms. And so normally I would say, what do you think is the number one thing my faculty colleagues want me to relate to you when I tell them I'm going to be telling students, new incoming freshmen, how to be successful. So anybody want to uh, email or chat with Kevin real quickly about what do you think the number one, the number one thing about being successful in any college class? What is the number one thing you need to do? We'll give it a few seconds to see if anyone can guess. We'll see if any, any responses come in. We have some, we have some sh shy ones here tonight. So someone, uh, Christopher says, managing your time. Managing your time is important very important, but it's not the number one. Okay, number you want to try one. again? What is the number one thing? Stacy says attendance and Tammy says going to class. Stacy and who? 
um, Tammy. Tammy says, Tammy, go. Tammy and Stacy, you guys, if I were face to face with you, I'd give you high fives because that is exactly the number one thing showing up in class. That's right. Showing right. up in class because uh, I know many of you have heard although you're too young to be playing the lottery, many of you have heard the lottery slogan, and that is, you can't win unless you play. Well, you really can't succeed in any college class unless you are engaged and involved in attending that class. Now, we'll talk about how that's going to change a little bit with the COVID-19 uh, situation, but you being engaged and attending class is really number one. What do you think number two is? All right, Dr. Ross has thrown it out to y'all. What do you think number two is? So we know the number one is going to class, okay? Now, what do you think number two is? The second most important thing. We'll wait a few seconds to see if we can get some responses. Now, I will know a, a little bit earlier, um, Heidi said reading your book was number one, but maybe that could act as number two as well. Heidi, you want to put that for number two? We will. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll say that's your submission for number two. Anybody else have uh, a number, another number two? Are the same. Stacy says homework and Matt says studying. Homework and studying and uh, reading the book. Those are all closely related. So I'll give all of you credit for right. the correct answer. Number two is doing the work, which would include studying, which would include the homework, which includes reading the book. Doing the work that is assigned, not the work you think, oh, I want to do that assignment. Um, I think I'll skip that one and I'll ask if I can write a paper instead so I can only focus on what I'm interested in. That's not going to lead to a very successful outcome at all. Because quite frankly, at this point of your academic life, you really can't write a really good paper. You just don't have enough information and you can say, oh, I can get it from the internet. No, you can't. Not the type of paper that we want you to write, and that is synthesizing and integrating information so you can understand the inferences and the consequences of that information. And that's one of the things we really want to do in our class lectures is make sure you understand the inferences. We all can Google facts and think about it. Why would an uh, employer want to hire you? they can Google their own facts. An employer is not going to hire you because of your ability to either Google facts or even to recite facts. They want people who can interpret the facts so it makes sense within the context with which you are working with. That's what every employer wants. And that's what we want you to practice doing with information in our classes is learning how to infer information, what else is needed, what are the consequences if we follow along that particular line of reasoning, what would be the consequences if we did not follow along a particular line of reasoning. Those are the types of things that we want to do in lecture. And those are the types of things that makes class enjoyable for, on, for not only the faculty, but for the students as well. So number one is showing up. Number two is doing the work. And what is number three? All right, everybody. Dr. Ross has thrown it out. We've got number one, showing up. Two, doing the work. What's number three? Give me your guesses, and I will read them to Dr. Ross and let you all know uh, whether you're right or not. So we'll wait a few more seconds to see if anyone can give us what they think is the correct answer. Wait a few more seconds. We'll see. We're going to get some good answers, I'm sure.
Nothing's coming in yet, Dr. Ross. You've stumped everybody. You've stumped everyone. Now we okay, we do have one from Tammy. Tammy says listening. Listening, paying attention. Basically, is that it, Tammy? Paying attention, listening. That's a good one. That's a good one. And I'll and and since you were uh, brave enough to uh, interact, I'm gonna say that's number three. Tammy just gave us number three, and that is paying attention and listening. Now, uh, COVID nineteen is throwing a wrinkle in how we normally conduct our classes. Many of your classes are going to be hybrid. For example, the class I teach is going to be a hybrid class. Uh, we, with the constraints that COVID-19 has uh, uh, applied to everyone, you know, we have to be six feet across, social distancing, et cetera, et cetera, which means that a classroom that will normally hold 300 people will now only hold 64. So you can see there are going to be space, uh, extreme space constraints on how we're going to be able to teach our classes. Uh, the classroom that I'm going to be using for introductory psychology holds 104 people after COVID. Before COVID, it held 500. After COVID, we're restricted to 104. So how am I going to teach a large lecture class with those type of constraints? How are any of us going to teach, even if the class is only 50 people or 30 people? That number gets reduced when we factor in uh, the social distancing requirements. So many of the classes at UofL are probably the majority are going to be what we call hybrid. Hybrid classes means that we will rotate a portion of students with face-to-face -face lectures. For example, let's say introductory to psychology has 400 students. I'm, I'm going to make it easy, um, easy math. Has 400 students. 25% of that 400 will have class on any one particular day. So that's 100 students, right? And so uh, that's group A. Group B is another 100 students. Group C, another 100. Group D, another 100. What will happen is we will teach 100 students at a time face to face. It will be in this large arena where you won't have to worry about um, social distancing because that's going to be mandated. The other 75% of the class will be online synchronously, meaning the way you are streaming the Facebook session live now, you will be in a live streaming situation. Whereas if you want to ask questions, those questions come to me. Uh, I will ask questions uh, for which you will get uh, uh, credit for using technology such as the iClicker, uh, the iClicker Cloud, the electronic version. And so the same uh, questions that I ask face to face, I will also be asking the 75% of the class who are synchronously viewing me. Now, in that environment where you really only show up live, as it were, face to face, 25% uh, of every, you know, like, you know, once every two weeks, if we use the 400. How do you stay engaged? How do you stay involved? That's going to be more the student responsibility. COVID is really changing a lot of things for the students. In a face-to-face -face class, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and I can direct the whole lecture around help you under, helping you understand uh, a, a particular concept or a, con or, or a particular term. With COVID-19, you will have that opportunity in the face-to-face -face class session, but you will also have that opportunity to do it synchronously online. I will have graduate students monitoring my online uh, section of the class and any questions you put out there, I can respond to in real time. But you are going to have to show up. Showing up is going to be even more important when we do 
hybrid classes. It's not optimal because I think all of us are somewhat, and, I'm, and, and I'm, I think I'm making this term up. Most of us are what we call energy vampires, meaning we feed off of each other's energy. As an instructor, I feed off the energy that the students bring and your excitement or your interests. You feed off of my energy when I'm responding to your questions. That's going to change somewhat with the COVID-19 environment, but you still are going to have to connect with me. If that's email after the lecture, if that is email before the lecture and say, I've been going over this material and these are some of the issues that I may have. So it's going to be more on the students, the responsibility for staying engaged and for letting me know what you need because I won't be able to see you all the time. So uh, that's the major change I think not only U of L will be undergoing, but I think every college or institution of higher learning, institutions of learning period are having to come up with innovative ways to get our excitement and our uh, love for our disciplines across the students. And we're going to try our darndest in the psychology department, I know. We, we are working on that now, how we can do that and keep you engaged and keep you informed. So at this point, does anyone have any questions? We'll turn it over to questions. If anyone has some questions um, for Dr. Ross, we are happy to answer those. Um, as, they're, as they're thinking of their questions, Dr. Ross, uh, we did get a shout out. Um, Christopher from Facebook said he loved the energy vampires analogy. So we do love hearing that and that's fantastic. Um, and I think it's also important to note Dr. Ross and, and I hope that you will agree with this. Um, it's important to you know um, be flexible when it comes to what's gonna happen in the fall and to work with your professors because um, I know when we were thinking about the spring, it was new for everybody. And that was something that was crazy for everyone. And so um, as, we, as we get ready to go into the fall and you know things might change from what a professor thought they were gonna do at the beginning of the semester to December in the end, um, which is, it, it's, it's always been an interesting time. Um, one thing I also think is pretty important is that um, to know that U of L is pretty unique and lucky across Kentucky in that we do have some of those big lecture style halls, um, but many times, many of our classes are a little bit smaller. And that kind of helps, especially as you get up into different programs or depending on your program, um, you might have classes, you know, our average class has, at the university as a whole is 26. So um, oftentimes we're gonna have the ability to still get you into the classroom as much as you can. Um, so it was still maintaining social distancing, of course, which is nice. So. Um, Definitely some good things to, to keep in mind. Um, Dr. Ross, we did have a question from Christopher. Um, he wants Hi, Christopher. <laughs> Hello, Christopher, thank you for asking. Um, he wants to know, how can we ensure that we stay engaged? Do you have any tips on that? Yes, I have a lot of tips on that. Thank <laughs> you, Christopher. Uh, you know, if I, I'll, I'll slip you a dollar bill for asking that question when I meet you in person, maybe. Okay, we'll sanitize it before we exchange money. <laughs> but um, one of the ways that you can stay engaged is make sure you are staying up on the information. So when I start lecturing, that information is not new are different to you. You've already covered the areas in the textbook and in my syllabus and most faculty syllabus, you will see exactly what we're going to cover, what you should be reading and what your assignment is. The mistake a lot of students make, and I made those mistakes as an undergraduate as well, particularly as a new freshman. And that mistake is thinking that you can catch up on a lot of material the night before the exam are that you really don't have to study little by little. One of the most um, profound and solid uh, uh, research findings in psychology on learning is that learning little bits over a longer period of time is far more effective than trying to cram information in in a short period of time. That little bits of information over a longer period is far more effective for retaining that information. 
Um, most students have been successful, me included. I, when I first went to college, um, I was successful uh, in high school. So I felt I could just use the same techniques and that is studying real hard right before the exam. Okay, that, that's gonna be a problem because the type of information we want from you is not just memory. Remember I said, I want you to be able to read a question, read a scenario, and based on the information you have within that context, come up with the right answer. And that right answer may not just be something on page 86, you know, in the textbook. I want you to think about that. So staying engaged means staying up on your uh, reading up on your homework. And I'm not going to promise you that every course you're going to take is going to be exciting and interesting because we know that would be a lie. I've had far more courses than you guys could even think about having. And in some of them, you know, I wanted to put bamboo shoots in my fingernails to be able to stay awake. And I was thinking, why couldn't someone invent some glasses that would look like your eyes are open where you were really snoozing in class? Been there, thought those thoughts, okay? Those are not very constructive or productive thoughts. You just have to suck it up and know that every course that you take in this curriculum is going to it's designed to be helpful in with you getting your degree i hope i answered your question let me know yes christopher said thank you so much so definitely sounds like you answered that question very well we definitely appreciate that um and again to everyone watching feel more than free to ask whatever questions you have for us and for dr ross um, I know there are some students out there watching who want to know what it's, you know, what's going to be helpful for them to be successful when they get to UofL and when they get into that college classroom. And Dr. Ross is an expert. Like she said, she's been teaching for a long time now. She knows the ins and outs of how to be successful. And so now is the time to ask those questions for Dr. Ross and for any parents. Um, sometimes it sounds a little bit easier, maybe coming from a parent than it would from a professor. So uh, maybe if you have questions on on how to get your student to be successful inside the classroom. Um, that would definitely be helpful as well. We'd be happy to, we're happy to chat with you about that and um, let you all um, kind of tell us what you wanna know about. That's why we're here tonight. So we definitely appreciate that. Um, Dr. Ross, we did have a pre-submitted question. And one thing I think is always interesting to note, sometimes students, when they get to college, feel a little bit intimidated by the professors because you know you're a doctor you've been in the field for a long time you do this crazy good research so i guess a question for you um what's the, what's the best way to approach that student professor relationship and do you mean to be intimidating when you're talking with students do you like talking with students yes <laughs> i like talking with students i like students being successful uh, I want to be one of the little people that you look back on, you know, when you uh, embark on your very successful career after college and say, I want to thank all the little people who helped me along the way. And I want to be one of the ones that you mentioned. Um, let me just give you um, a quick uh, uh, relay uh, uh, incident that happened in 2000, long time ago, 2000, <laughs> 2008. Okay, oh, this is really bad. 2008 was 12 years ago. Seems just like <laughs> yesterday. There was a freshman student who uh, um, was in the psychology department. He wanted to be a psychology major. And he wasn't really doing that well, but he figured out what he was doing wrong. And he uh, plugged those holes as it were. And one of the things that the psychology department offers and will still do so, and we're working on how we will do so, is we offer um, research opportunities for undergraduates. Um, when I was an undergraduate, my psychology course had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, students in it. And that was back in the day when we used overheads. And um, I, was a, I was a chemistry major at the time when I started college. And I was so arrogant. 
and full of myself because I had this big shot scholarship that was a full ride to any school that I wanted to go to. And so I knew I was all that plus. And so no one could tell me anything. I was just so smart. Now my father said smart something else, but you know, hyphenated word, but so when I started college, I knew I, 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 I was accomplished. I, I knew all there was to know. And I got my hiney handed to me after the first quarter. And I saw grades I never even knew existed. And I really had to figure out what I needed to do to change. My professors weren't going to change. I had to figure out what to do. And I relayed this to the student. And this student also figured out what it was he had to do to be successful. Let me interject something right now. And that is what the psychological definition of intelligence is. The psychological, uh, and, and this combines a lot of different um, uh, theories and a lot of different definitions, but the definition of intelligence as far as we are concerned is the ability to adapt to a changing environment. You didn't hear ACT scores. You didn't hear GPA. You didn't hear ACT. You heard no scores at all in that definition. The ability to adapt to a changing environment. What does that mean? It means that even though I was successful, I was valedictorian of my high school class. So I was extraordinarily successful in high school. But how smart was I when I was persisting to holding on to strategies and to ideas that didn't help me in college? I had to change. I had to change myself. I couldn't go tell my professors, hey, you, you, you didn't do this like Mr. Woolworth did, so you better change because if you did it the way my high school teachers did it, I'd be getting A's. So you're teaching wrong. That won't get you very far. So I had to figure out what I had to do to change. This student, when I relate my personal experience that I was in that same situation, he figured out what he had to do to change. And he became very successful. And one of the things that happened to me after I, you know, figured out how to really be successful and get off my high horse and accept that advisors actually do know what they're doing and tutors are there for a reason. So when I figured all of that out and started doing better, um, I took my first psychology class, as a matter of fact. And I was annoyed I had to take it because it was a gen ed course and I didn't know why they were making me take anything but chemistry because I knew, I knew what I wanted to be. I knew what I was going to do in life. Those other kids, they needed help, but I knew, ha, I have a PhD, an MA and a BA in psychology. So it tells you after that first class, I never took another chemistry class. And I, um, and with all those hundreds and hundreds of students, which makes our classes look small, I went to the professor and said, could I help you in your lab? And he goes, sure. And so I have my first professional uh, uh, journal article published publication when I was a junior because I worked in a research laboratory and I uh, uh, gained the trust and got more and more responsibility. So I became actually a co-author of papers. We allow our undergraduate students to do that. If there's, and I told this one particular student, uh, are you interested in the work I'm doing? He goes, nah, <laughs> did not take it personally. So I asked him what his interests were and I fit him with a member of the psychology faculty. I introduced them and I said, you know, I think you guys will, will you know, get along well and he's really interested. Well, he graduated with honors and actually received the American Psychological Association Fellowship for graduate work. Wow. And he and let me tell you, that is a big, big deal. And he received that because of the research he did as an undergraduate. Now he has a doctorate himself. 
He is a colleague and he actually sponsors a, uh, a scholarship for African-American students, actually, the, the, the Nifley scholarship that he named after his grandmother. So uh, we really encourage students to get engaged, to get involved, take advantage of the opportunities that you don't get other than at a research university, faculty doing hands-on research. So uh, you can become one of those students who also, as an undergraduate, you know, goes to conferences, make presentations, and have your name on a publication. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, that's such a very good answer. It's such a very cool story. Um, I loved hearing that. That's that's fantastic. How you how you can help change and guide a life, and how that happened to you as well. And hopefully, we'll see a lot. You'll see a lot of that as well um, when you all come to the University of Louisville for sure. But we did get a bunch of questions rolling in while you were telling that story. So we got a bunch of questions for you. So we'll start. Out with this one um this is from tammy first off she wants to say thank Hi, you for tammy. that's thank you tammy for joining us tonight um so she wants to know she says when i was a freshman it seemed the overall mood was to weed out those who were struggling and the stuff like that i am pleased that this does not seem to be the case at the university of louisville is that correct i can tell you in my classes and in my department and with my colleagues that is not correct that is a very elitist uh, attitude that is not very productive in nurturing new talent and getting new ideas in any discipline. Any discipline who holds that idea or holds that philosophy will find itself dying off. Absolutely. Yes, Tammy, I'm so sorry you had that experience. And I can say, you know, I, I know a bunch of student, uh, current students now, and I've known some that have struggled in classrooms. And it's more than just the professors who are there to help you. It is a whole team. It really does. It's a village at the University of Louisville um, who is there to help you. And it kind of goes into something else that I was going to ask about later. But um, and Dr. Ross, if you have any experience with this, you're more than welcome to um, kind of chime in. But I've known professors to reach out to refer students to the writing center or to that free tutoring at REACH and the Student Success Center, um, or just sit down and say, hey, what can I do to help? And what can we do to get you a plan to get back on track? Um, and I, I think that's something that is pretty awesome at the University of Louisville that we we teach, teach we, we um, think of teaching, excuse me, think of education as a team effort. Um, and that, that's very important. So um, yes, awesome. Thank you so much, Tammy, for your question. We also have another question. Question, And this question, I believe, is from, it's from Stacy. Um, so Stacy, thank you for joining us again tonight. Um, Stacy wants to know, how do you keep from getting overwhelmed the first semester until you get into a routine? That's a very good question, Stacy. And one of the things that you have to do is breathe. You have to be able to take a deep breath when you feel yourself being overwhelmed, when you feel yourself saying, I can never uh, keep up with all of this. Take a deep breath and uh, attack your tasks one by one. Instead of looking at the forest and being overwhelmed because the forest seems so vast and so unapproachable, look Dr. Ross, I think um, I think your mic had gone out, unfortunately. We missed a little bit of that. Um, if you want to try speaking, we can't hear you. We can't How about hear you. now? Now now you can. Yes, you're back. I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> Don't know what happened. Technology. It Love it. Happens. Love it. Okay. <laughs> okay. What didn't you hear? What's the last thing you heard? Um, we were talking, it was literally like the very beginning. So we missed a bug. Oh, okay. So okay. I said, again. one of the things you can do is to realize there are people here to help you if you start feeling overwhelmed. What you do is we have tutors. The REACH um, organization has been recognized internationally as being one of the most effective tutoring centers in the world. And they 
um, not only are tutors, but they are students tutors. And these are students who have gone through some of the same things you're going through. So if you're having a problem in a particular class and you feel overwhelmed by a class, go to REACH and they can help you break it down. Go to your instructor in a class and say, I'm feeling overwhelmed. Help me develop a strategy where I can get everything done without feeling so, so lost and overwhelmed. Uh, we're here to help you. I'm not, I don't want anybody to say, um, I, I just quit coming to class because I felt so overwhelmed. I, I failed if you feel that way. So uh, you can always contact me, for example, and I can say do A, B, C, or D. But you have to realize, and someone said the number one thing is time management. That's not number one, but that's the overall reaching umbrella for everything. And sometimes time can just get away from us. And I still feel that way sometimes now, even if I have a paper that's due or I have something that's due, uh, it's sort of like, oh my gosh, can I get done, get everything done? So we also have um, a student, what is it called when, you know, uh, Kevin, uh, where they can go get mindfulness training and go get, um, get healthy now type of thing. I know exactly what you're talking about. I can't think of the exact name, but it's all available like for free in the Student Success Center and in the yes. Student Activity Center. Yes, yes. So if you think, oh, you know, I've got to learn how to do time management, they do courses on time, and all of this is free. You don't pay a penny for any of this. The only thing you have to do is make an appointment and show up. And I, I really can't um, uh, uh, emphasize the success rate that these uh, um, programs have and how they have helped so many students. When I was an undergraduate, if I went to tutoring, I had to pay for it. If I went to anything like this, it was a la carte, means, you know, out of your own pocket. And so a lot of students failed because they couldn't avail themselves of the type of resources that they needed to succeed. Here at UofL, every resource you're going to need is available to you at no charge. Absolutely. I hope that was helpful. Yes, I think it definitely was. And I'll, I'll just add on that. I think it's important to note every professional Professor, every faculty member, every staff member at the University of Louisville has been in the same place that you have. We are in this. We are in the same shoes. We have felt overwhelmed just like you have, and so still you know, do. We still do. Exactly. Exactly. Many times we still do, and so we get it. And you know, college is one of those times where on any given night you can have 450 different things to do. And that first week of classes, you're going to be overwhelmed with how much freedom you have, how exciting it is to go do so many different things. And I definitely think Dr. Ross is correct that time management and prioritizing why you're here, why you're here will help you out so much. Um, and just recognizing you're here for your education first and you can still have all the fun in the world while getting your education at the same time. And all of us have done it. And so that's, that's one of the best things. So um, Dr. Ross, we have another question, and this is one I, th I think you'll be interested in, or I hope you'll be super interested in as well. It's about research. And so um, you mentioned earlier, we are um, mandated by the Kentucky state um, government to um, be a research institution. We are an R1 research institution. So we That's at the top of the heap. The very top of the heap. We are also, this is a little fun fact for you. We're one of only, I think, 67 or 69 schools in the country that are the top research level you can be and the top community engagement level you can be at the same time. We are one of a handful of schools in the country that have both of those. That is the coolest thing I think in the world, but I digress. Um, so one thing um, someone wants to know, and this question is from, I believe, Heidi. Let me make sure, um, uh, or Stacy, excuse me. Nope, it's from, it's, it was from Heidi. Yes, Heidi wants to know, um, what research are, are you currently doing and how do you get students, or how do students get into helping with research? I know you talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, could you go a little bit more in depth about how students um, can talk with the professors about doing some research? Okay, now on our uh, psychological and brain sciences, the name of our department uh, webpage, you will find uh, a list of the faculty with active research labs and they are always, we are always on the lookout for new research assistants, people who could help us with our research. Now, um, people are very uh, um, prone to not want first semester freshmen. 
for obvious reasons. You're already overwhelmed. You're learning how, you know, your water wings work. And so we don't want to overwhelm you with other responsibilities. Uh, I was a sophomore when I started working in a research lab, and that's what most people want, at least sophomore, uh, junior level, where you have learned how to wade through all the demands of college life. But a list of all the research that's currently being done is, is posted uh, on the webpage of, of the Psychological and Brain Sciences Department. Awesome. So thank you so much for that question. And for anyone else watching, we still do have about 15 more minutes to spend with you all tonight talking about how to be successful as a student um, or just talking about general student questions you might have. So whether you're a student currently at the University of Louisville, maybe you hopped on to learn a little bit more uh, from Dr. Ross, or maybe you're coming in into the University of Louisville in the fall and we're super excited to have you. Or maybe you're just a parent of an incoming student, someone who might be joining U of L in the future. We're here tonight to ask or to answer your questions. So go ahead in the Facebook chat feature that you're um, viewing this video on. You should be able to see a little comment box. Ask us whatever questions you have. We're happy to answer them and to chat with you all here tonight. Um, one question we do have Dr. Ross, and I know this was a pre-submitted question. Um, one thing people always want to know about is when they're taking notes. There's a, there's a fine line and no one knows quite what to do of, should I write down every single thing that faculty member is saying, or should I write down just the key points or when is too much and when is too little? So do you have any advice on that? Okay, I'm, it may sound like I'm digressing a little bit and I hope you get the big picture here. Uh, there's a lot of research actually that has been done, uh, not just on the content of, note, of good note taking, but how the mechanism most students at this point take uh, notes electronically. You have a tablet, you have a laptop, and you click, click, click away, and you're taking notes. People who take electronic notes are better suited to almost get word by word, verbatim. You know, you just, you know, there, there's a, a psychological mechanism, a physiological neuronal mechanism for that actually, but you can almost get verbatim everything and students have these really long list of notes that they have taken electronically. So is it better to handwrite notes or to take notes electronically? When you handwrite notes, you cannot possibly, on God's green earth, get down every word. You don't write that fast. So therefore, it sounds as if to get more uh, quantity, take notes electronically. That's where intuition fails us. The research shows that students who take notes by hand do better on exams over that information than students who take notes electronically. Now you say, but there's so much more information I can write down when I take notes electronically. That's the problem. You're taking down all of this information and really not thinking about it. You're just taking it down as if just having the notes per se is all you need. No, you need to understand and synthesize the notes. When you take notes by hand, by definition, you are synthesizing and parsing out the information as you write it down because you can't write down every word. So you are synthesizing the information that you hear as you take notes. And that's the key of taking good notes, synthesizing the information. And you say, but I don't know how to do that. I just know how to do it word by word by word by word. It just really takes practice. And you can practice taking good notes by looking at any TV program or looking at any talk show or looking up a TED talk, a TED talk that you're interested in on YouTube, look up a TED talk and practice writing down very good notes about what the person is talking about. And then you can go back and review the TED talk and you can see how accurate you were. So that's a good way of practicing taking good notes. And remember, even if you have a, a laptop available to you, and I hope you do because you're gonna need a laptop and not a tablet and not a Chromebook, you're gonna need a laptop 
to be able to download information on. Uh, and you should be getting that information um, more broadly, but the faculty at UofL want you to have something where you can download information to. So that leaves out iPads, it leaves out Chromebooks, it leaves out Android tablets. You need something where you can download information onto a hard drive. But that's, even if you have something like that, most uh, laptops now, um, you can, uh, they have a touch screen where you can write notes. So even if you have the ability to take notes electronically, write those notes, write those notes out, don't type them, write them. And there's some evidence that the muscle memory from just writing down information also helps you retain that information. And remember the whole purpose of notes is for you to retain information, not that you can show someone that you have 15 pages of notes and how good your note taking was. It was it's to retain information. Absolutely. Did that answer that? Absolutely, absolutely. And I can attest to it, Dr. Ross. My first semester in college, I was what I, I felt like a student zombie. I would go in class, write down everything the professor said, and I would leave and I would leave the classroom and say, I don't even remember being in that class. Class. I don't remember a word that my professor said. It is like you're in and then 50 minutes later, the class is over and you're like, I don't, I, I wasn't paying attention at all. And that is the most scary thing in the entire world. I'll tell you what, it is when hard. You're taking notes that you have notes that you wrote down, but you weren't paying attention. Not at all. And that is very, uh, very possible. Uh, back in the day, kids, way back in the day, there was a profession known as stenographers. And stenographers, only thing they did are court stenographers. You can still see that on old Perry Mason uh, reruns, where the court stenographer is literally writing down verbatim every word that is spoken. And Perry Mason will say, would you read back what the witness said to this question, blah, 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 blah. And the stenographer will, you know, whip out the, the transcript and read it verbatim. Okay, there was a study done with the memory of stenographers, even though these people, and we, they, the study was only done with the top 1% of this particular population. So they were very good stenographers. They got every word verbatim, word by word, but they couldn't remember anything. They couldn't remember any conversation. They couldn't remember anything that was said because it was on rote, R-O-T-E, on rote, that they were just writing down the words. They weren't thinking them. They weren't looking for connections. And that's what happened to you, right, Kevin? Absolutely. I can and now you know. Now you know you could have been in that study. Exactly. <laughs> well, um, y'all, it looks like we have time for a few more questions, maybe one or two more questions. So we do have one from Christopher. And Dr. Ross, I'm not sure exactly how much um, you might have worked with this particular population. Um, but Christopher wants to know, um, he says he knows someone that plans on working the night shift at UPS through Metro College. A lot uh, of students do that. To get through their student, exactly, to get through their schooling. Do you have any tips for them on how to be successful? Working the night shift especially when you're right out of high school and you've never had to juggle these type of responsibilities before. And unfortunately, students say, I work the night shift and I get off at 6 a.m. and I'm taking an eight o'clock class. Don't, don't. All I can say is don't. Coming off the night shift and then taking an early morning class is not gonna be conducive to anything but early exhaustion and frustration. So um, my tip would be for that person to try to arrange their class so that they can get some sleep before they car to take a class. Let me, I, you know, research is a thing with, with psychologists, but uh, there's a study that was done um, with cockroaches and memory. And some people say cockroaches will once will rule the world at one time, they'll be the only things that survive. But this researcher took cockroaches and he had this little maze that he created. And there was a sugar cube at the end of the maze and the cockroaches had to learn to run the maze to get to the right sugar cube. Right after the cockroach ran the maze and got to the end and got the sugar cube, one half of that group was put in little tiny match boxes, individual match boxes, which means they were uh, restrained. 
because they're in this little tiny uh, matchbox. The other group were allowed to continue wandering around the maze. Eight hours later, they tested the memory of the cockroaches on who could remember what the, the running the, the correct way to get to the, you know, the end of the maze. What do you think the results were? The cockroaches that were immobilized did significantly better than the cockroaches that were allowed to roam after they learned something. And the interpretation of that and the whole context of the study was that the body and the brain needs rest after getting information if you want to remember that information. So rest is very, very important. And, and coming to class exhausted means you're really not going to get any information to retain. So getting a good night's sleep before and after you have to, uh, are getting sufficient sleep, I'll say sufficient sleep, before and after you have to uh, learn something is better than just pushing yourself to virtual physical exhaustion. Been there, done that also. Absolutely. And I'll say, I'll tell you, Dr. Ross, I'm a big scaredy cat when it comes to bugs. So I could not be in that research study, but I'm glad someone did it. I, I, did it. I, I think that's a hoot though, because <laughs> nobody I know would want to do that study. I know. Talk I about know. washing your hands. <laughs> well, Dr. Ross, we have um, just a few minutes left. So it, and then if you take like one or two minutes um, to kind of wrap up and say um, what you hope that the, the incoming class of students um, prepares for, or maybe your wish for them as they get ready to um, transition into college life, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, I hope that you will be, as Kevin pointed out, flexible. Flexible in the sense that this is going to be new. I've never taught a hybrid class before, ever. So being able to rotate hundreds of students, some face-to-face, -face, some online, to be able to respond to the questions and the needs of all of these students in different modalities is going to be challenging. But I'm excited to face the challenge, and I'll tell you this, and I guarantee this from all of my colleagues, you put yourself in the position to try to adapt and learn and we'll make sure that we put ourselves in the position to help you. Don't use, and, and let me give you a warning, don't use the COVID-19 as an excuse for sloppy study habits and sloppy work. It's gonna come back and bite you. But if you honestly put out the effort, I'm here to help you. All of us are here to help you and we'll get, we will, this too shall pass as the saying goes, as the proverb says. So put out your best effort. This is no, no college class ever has had to do what you are going to be required to do. It's gonna be challenging in that sense. And, um, it's amazing, and I have the highest respect for those of you who say, I'm up to the challenge. I think I can do this. I'm going to try my darndest to do this, because unfortunately, this may be the new normal for a while. And we don't want you to put your higher education aspirations on hold until we get a vaccine. So um We'll, we'll get through this together and we'll get through this successfully, successfully for you. I'm a success if you are a success and I want you to be a success. Never heard truer words, Dr. Ross. I love hearing that. That's a great way to end our very first Cardinal Insider Series session. So we appreciate you all joining us, Dr. Ross. I can't even tell you how many um, comments there are that are so appreciative of you and thankful for you for for joining us and all of your great words. Thank you. So thank you. thank you, Dr. Ross. We appreciate you so much for joining us. To everyone watching tonight, um, thank you for spending a little piece of your evening with us and chatting with us um, about how to be successful inside the classroom and to hear some tips on a, from a faculty favorite. And you all now know why she is a faculty favorite um, and will remain a faculty favorite for years to come, I am sure.
Once again, if you all have any questions um, after the presentation is over um, about anything at all, we are here for you. So we are happy to answer whatever questions you have. Um, as admissions counselors, you can use the Find Your Counselor feature on our website or reach out to our main admissions website, admitme at louisville.edu. Um, we are, again, so overjoyed. We have many more sessions coming up. We have one next week on REACH, um, which we mentioned tonight. We'll talk a little bit more about REACH. Um, we also have some sessions coming up, like I mentioned, there's one on July 8th about um, the COVID-19 plan to pivot to the fall. Um, so I'm, I'm sure both of those will be extremely informative and something you wanted to tune in for. Um, once again, one last time, thank you, Dr. Ross. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for everyone for joining us. Um, I'm going to end this session with a nice little go cards, um, and we are going to be good to go. Thank you all so much.